If Murray had supported the show, I'd be less sick of podcasts. Blah, blah, blah. The blah, blah, blah. Sending out good vibes. Shivers or vibrations and stuff like that. And that's also explained in one single graphic. I mean, I think a 12 year old can understand what I'm doing in that graphic. And it solves the great inequality, which was the, one of the biggest debates they had in the 18th century. Okay, guys, welcome back to the Great America Show. We are going to be chatting with Simon Shack and uh, Lund Hunquist. <laughs> Patrick, Patrick Holmquist. <laughs> Patrick Holmquist. Yeah. I mean, it, they're tricky names because, of course, these guys are European dudes. And uh, so we had to do this on a Sunday morning in order to get them, but fascinating stuff. I mean, there was a two, I, I believe one of them, they were in two different places. Was it like yep, Sweden yep, and France places, or something yep, like that? Yep, yep, or Italy yep. or, no, we had an Italian earlier that day. We did, yes, yes. yes it was a European Sunday, yes. Euro Sunday. Euro Sunday. Yeah, a little gay, but it was all right. <laughs> um, so anyway, Patrick and... Uh, Patrick and Simon, and Simon yeah. did a great job of breaking this down. We did go on to the, the Tycho dot. Tycosium. Tycosium. Ty yeah. Um, yeah. Which when Graham does the bio, he'll give you the URL for that. You might, if you're at home and you're listening, if you, if you're, at, <laughs> I love the panic. If you're at home and you're just sitting around, you might want to have this open on your computer. You can poke around with a little bit while yes, you're listening. It's pretty cool. Definitely. Um, Go on to tycos.space. Tycos.space, because Simon came up with the book, It's and it's right there. All the chapters are there, too. It's awesome. Right online there. Um, and then Patrick put it into a his tycosium which is a 3d model with and you can change all the parameters and all you can see all the planets spinning around and they used actual ab observational data in there and 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 the tycho's model so it's kind of like a neo tyke neo tycho bravo model of of our solar system it's pretty cool and it seems to be a working model it predict all the eclipse predicts like everything that the standard model eclipse uh, predicts and more maybe so interesting one for sure yeah yeah and we're gonna do so before we forget we're gonna do a live youtube probably with them probably two weeks this sunday so it's gonna be like maybe uh the third week of uh, uh something like uh january 21st maybe oh, sorry not january, january. Um, august, august <laughs> where the fuck was i august 21st um, we'll, we'll let everybody know, but we're going to go through, like have them go through the actual Tychosium and, and show all the different things. Cause it's super visual and you can, you can speed it up to like, um, you know, one second equals one day, one month, one year, one week. And you can see the thing spinning and rotating and it starts to look like a, like a pump in a way, if you back off the, the view a little bit, um, you can do all kinds of things with it. So we'll do like an actual video with them on it about it. Absolutely. Great show. Great guys. I hope you guys enjoy it, but we'll get through our little lazy ramblings here. You can skip it, of course, if you go to the timestamp in the show notes. So what have you been up to? Have you recovered? How is your little c seti sleepover? How's that settling? Uh, good. Well, I got. I was a little bit out of sorts with this, uh, this powerful amulet that I'm wearing that was given. That you were going to... I've done some research on that. Um, that I was going to what? You were asking me about it because uh, I said apparently they, there was a book given. Um, oh yeah, and I asked about the book from ET and engine and and on how to create these things, and it's actually quite a, a fascinating uh, amulet. It's called the uh, the nuclear receptor, and it's a scalar wave generating device designed to protect the human body from negative frequencies, radiation, and toxins coming from a variety of outside and inside sources, and to recharge the body's energy. So it's like made by this company called Paradigm. And what a rabbit hole! I just went down to try and like pull up some more information on this uh, on this this pendant. 
but it's got like all this sacred geometry in there. So basically it's like, it's got a gemstone in the center and then it's got these arms that go down in the Fibonacci sequence in a pyramidal shape. And it's got a whole bunch of pyramids on this disc. It's almost like a, like a satellite. It says, um, you can interchange the gemstone, but I don't have that, that this, oh, maybe that's not the same. Well, maybe it is the same one. I, I don't have the technique to change the gemstone, but, um, let me just read here what it says. Um, Gemstone yeah, changing. The energy technique. level of the body is balanced and increase the higher frequencies. These receptors rewind the DNA, helping to fight the aging process. It's been a great asset and touched the lives of millions of people, including famous athletes, celebrities, and scientists. Um, I'm going to just click on this and see what it says about this thing. It's click, got the, click, click, it's click. like, so, so it's a, it's a, pro, a patented process that captures and amplifies the power of gemstones, uh, resonating energy of pyramids, the life-sustaining pattern of the Fibonacci curve, and it's exactly calibrated and masterly handcrafted. Um, it goes beyond the normal like color therapy and stuff, and it gets into all this. Like it's it's basically absorbs radiation. It's a, you know because we've done these shows recently on scalar stuff, so I thought it was interesting enough to to talk about it. It promotes mind and body calming. It helps it my body process negative toxins and negativity, shields and protects from harmful effects of bad frequencies, uh, stress support, purify and balance, increase and in focus energy. And I do notice it today. I was a little off, a little sick for a couple of days with it. And uh, actually today I had a weird thing in my ear. I think it might be fixing my ear, my left ear. Fixing it? Yeah. What was wrong with it? Now I'm feeling that, well, it's, it's bad. It's bad here. You have a bad ear. Yeah. But anyways. What? But I think it's. That's um, a thing. I think it's a, tu- I think I'm sort of attuning to it and it's, uh, it's keeping, it's, uh, it's, I feel focused. So yeah. Anyways, what a rabbit hole about the guy who, who developed this. Um, He's been on Art Bell a bunch of times. He was in the defense. He was uh, involved with the UFO documents and in the defense agency. And then he started learning about Eastern mysticism and uh, getting into homeopathy and all this stuff. Like, holy, what a, what a, what a journey. So I'm going to put a link to this guy in the show notes from this paradigm, pyridine. So it's based on pyramids, pyramid shapes as well. His name's Fred Bell. Is he related to Art Bell? No, but he was on Art Bell a lot, and he died, and he passed away in 2011. Oh, that's too bad. But he trained with Himalayan teachers, uh, chiropractor, naturopath, PhD in homeopathic medicine. But he also went through the whole defense, like the uh, whole NASA related position in the private sector for eight years, consulting these companies, defense contractors. Involved in, he had a, he actually even developed an early spaceship engine concept design. He worked for like similar projects like Star Wars and ILS Project, the Apollo missions. It's crazy stuff, dude. That is crazy. Yeah. And there's a whole bunch of little tiny pyramids on this thing. Like it's very, very detailed. Ooh, it's exciting. Yeah. So, did you see the orb I sent you? Yeah, you didn't. Did you look? At I it? looked at it briefly, dude. It's the one of the best orb pictures now. I've I'll ever seen. I'll look again now. now. Uh, you and your orbs. There's some orb videos. If you go to like our first ever YouTube videos, there's pictures of Graham's orbs. For those yours? No, they were rise. Oh, rise right. orbs. Yeah, you knew rise. Dude, way I'm back telling then. you, like this is orb hour, and we're out at the C five. Like it gets to be dusk, and orb hour. And Kareen takes f- pictures of all these orbs. She goes around with a digital camera and she captures certain things, but she also gets bugs in there too. And we pick those out. This is not a bug. This is the only one that survived the, uh, the analysis. Basically, this is the best orb shot, but there are like the, the flash will catch bugs and they look super, super weird too, especially in that place where we were, there's could a ton a of bug. bugs high up. Looks like it could be a bug. A, 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 no, it's a perfect circle, though. That's a perfect circle, dude. And if you look, if you zoom right in, it's got that orb sort of like weird structure. Accidentally archived it. Yeah. So, anyways, that so that's how you know we talked about it last week, and I wanted to show you it. It's definitely between you and the trees. It seems like 
You sure yeah. it's not a bug? I'd like to see a bug so I can know what I'm Yeah, yeah, is. yeah. No, they're like super bug like that. You can see the wings. Everything's like shining, right? What if they're super close or farther away, though? Is there at any point do they just make a. No, an they orb? never just make an orb never, shape. They never no, do that. No, that never they... happens. That never happens. I don't think it does. It's a happens. bug. It's a. It's a bug shape. So. I, I faux pod. Oh, no. Turns out. <laughs> <laughs> I went out for a double faux pas, actually. So get this. So Brady and I went out for dinner Saturday night? Yeah. Saturday night. So we're looking for a place downtown to go for dinner. Kind of go for a walk. It's a nice night. It's a very festive street. Lots going on. Um, so we go by this place, and it's called The Coop. And we're like, oh, it must be chicken. So we like, we go, we oh sit down, <laughs> we get settled and, and, uh, it's a stupid fucking scan menu. So I got to scan the menu. And so it's all like taking a minute. So by the time, like we get to the menu, we've already like, you know, got a coffee and a drink and you know, we're like into it. And then we start going for the, through the menu and there's like, there's no chicken as much as like tofu and stuff. So, I've been there before. So we're like, oh my God, bro. I think this is a fucking vegan joint. So it turned out to be a vegetarian place. So they had an egg. So I ended up having like an egg sandwich for dinner, which wasn't the greatest, but I did have this little like. What was it though, if it's egg? It was real egg because it's vegetarian. Oh, they're allowed eggs, but the vegans aren't? Yeah, but the vegans okay. aren't. So okay, okay. Honestly, I would have laughed, but we were kind of like settled in and stuff. It was just like, oh God. God. So I tried out some vegan food, some vegetarian food, I guess, because it had some egg on it. It wasn't the best. The soup was good. It was very eggy because it was like a lot of egg. It was too much. And I had just had eggs for lunch too. So, but anyway, so then we leave there and we go, we're going to pin bar. Because there's this, oh, yeah, this yeah. place down 17th too. that's yeah. got all these pinball yeah, machines. Pinball right? machines, yeah. So I go there and I order, I tried to order a glass of wine and they didn't have any wine, but he's like, we have canned rosé. And I was like, what is that? And he's like, it's like rosé wine in a can. And I was like, dude, that's the gayest shit I've ever heard. And I'm like, he got pretty offended. So I gave him, <laughs> so I gave him a nice tip. And I like, we went and played a game and I went and sat down. I went downstairs to the bathroom and there's two bathrooms and they both just say gender neutral on the door. And I'm like, what the fuck is happening? So I looked in and I went in the one with the urinals. So anyway, I come to find out that that pin bar is this like, you know, this ultra woke place downtown that like is gender neutral and they have a bunch of LBGTPQQ nights and stuff like that, which is nothing wrong with that. <clears throat> but anyway, buddy wasn't super happy. I didn't really notice Brady noticed. So how did, how did, uh, uh can we not call things gay anymore? No, dude. How, where have you been for the last like three years here with you? <laughs> now that you're on the prowl again you're out for an awakening it didn't go well anyway it went well after that it was fine it was just the one guy everyone else there was a real sweetheart so, so. what so women are sharing the bathroom with you too then like in there well i went in the boys bathroom so well yeah but it's 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 gender is, it, is there multi people or is it a single bathroom or no it's multi-person Wow, that's weird. So, so one is all stalls. I guess I could have been a jerk and went in the women's bathroom. Well, no, that's it's, it's no, no, no. We're not normalizing gender this. neutral. We're you not can norm go in no, any bathroom, no, right? No, what? No, I don't get I, it. I'm going in the boys' bathroom. But how do you know it's boys until you look well, in? I looked I mean, for urinals. Make... What? I looked for urinals. Yeah. Oh my god. Right? This is where we're at. You have to look in to see. I guess what... that's the only place I've ever gone where it's been a thing. Oh, it's going to be all over. It's coming. Yeah, it's, it's a pinball. Uh, Why this pinball? Is a, the first time. Well, I think the owner might be gay or something. But anyway, I actually found a story here that says. Um, Pinballs are gay? 
Pinbar asked patrons to leave hate at the door. I didn't say gay in a hate way. It's just a thing we do when I was a kid. That's so. not an article about you, is it? No. Did you get kicked <laughs> out? No. <laughs> I didn't get kicked out. No. I was just, uh, anyway, it was okay. It turned out to be okay in the end, but it was a very awkward situation. A couple in a row, because first it was a thing I said, which is, I guess, a faux pas. I said that it was gay. And not that there's anything wrong with that or anything. It's just the thing I said. And then I went downstairs and had the gender neutral bathroom thing, which just threw me for a loop. And then we left. Well, I think that you, I feel like we, we stopped saying it for a while and now you're back for some reason, something's triggered you to get back on that thing. And now it might be the monkey pox thing. It might be some, cause you've, everybody's been talking about that a little bit more. But about saying there was a time when gay you, you couldn't say it for a while there so i don't know well why. i think it's just come too it's far it's kind of vernacular yeah, now. it's coming back what? it's coming back a bunch of that well, stuff's coming back because they just pushed too far yeah that's yeah, what I it is you, dude. I, I i hear you it's just i just don't know why i don't want to go down that whole row but okay, i just okay, thought it was a down. story okay, yeah. anyway today uh oh no today was good we went out to the bush and and uh we went for weapons training I kind of threw you a loose invite, but you really didn't seem like you were too interested. No, um, you didn't. You just said you were going, so I yeah. figured that wasn't an invite. <laughs> it was, you figured it was an anti-invite? Yeah. I totally. figured you'd have been like, I well, thought about it. plus the other day, I was like, I'll probably go shoot the bow on the weekend. And you were like, oh, maybe you'll get that piece. But anyway, did you get the piece? No, no, and I've been working. You don't have a release either, do you? Or do you? Or do you just use your fingers? Uh, I don't have a release for the for the recurve. I do for the for the compound. compound. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, the recurve so is just a, the recurve is really just a backup. I need to just practice with that just in case because if I if shit goes down, the compound bow is not going to last very long. This is going to break and stop working because dude, they they're finicky. They're 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 what are you delicate. About? They're delicate. What? Finicky. I've shot. Over a thousand arrows with my bow, and I haven't had one <laughs> fucking problem. I know, but you're not hauling it around like in the apocalypse. If it gets apocalyptic, it's going to be think, delicate. You I'm think that's you. more delicate than your recurve for some fucking fucked up reason? Your problem Dude, is you yeah, can't hit the broadside of a barn. You can't hit the broadside of a barn, so you're just going to be out of arrows. If it, if, <laughs> that's a different problem. <laughs> anyway. So we took, me and Miles took the bows. Well, he doesn't have a bow, but he shot mine a little bit. But we mostly were going out to get the rifles ready because, uh, I mean, ammo is so expensive. It sucks. But I've been meaning to go out and really dial in and get comfortable because I just got a new scope last year. And uh, I had it on, and it works in close range, but I'm still not comfortable really shooting out past 100 yards with it or so. Yeah, I know. Tell me about it. Tell you about it? Yeah. Why? I was with you when I found those two elk on the ridge. And oh, and we missed them. Yeah, well, it was pretty we windy, too. And... It was pretty windy. I still shot two elk in two days. Yeah, I know. Anyway, so we went out and just did a whole bunch of shooting. So I got my scope. I didn't have to adjust it much. Two ticks up on my scope. So I found out that I had adjustable reticle that I didn't know about. So that's probably why I was like... There's a real chance I could have been shooting like super low at long distances. But anyway, I got it dialed in today. I got like two inch groupings at a 200 yards, so I should be good. Ready for hunting season. Got the bow ready. I'm super comfortable with that now. That is now fully cranked out to the 75 pounds. Is that your max? Is that the max? That's like? the max now, yeah. Wow, really, eh? It's pull. It's, oh yeah. It's not, I mean, I got, got the hang of it now. When I first cranked to 75, I was like, because I went up the last six pounds all at once. I was going up three pounds at a time, but it's like, it's getting close. It's only like three and a half weeks to the start of the season. So I was like, fuck it. I'm going to just go six pounds all at once. So I went from like 69 right to 75. And I was like, whew. But after a week of that, you know, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. It's no problem. And that's really like, and it's still the same. Like, do you need it to at be at full that, draw? It's the same it? thing. At, at full draw, it feels the no, same. No, no, I, I know. It's just hard to get it there. It's just a bit of a bitch to get it there. But if you're hunting with it, do you need it at 75 or could you hunt with it 50? You could ar arguably hunt with it at 50. I think the legal is 40 or 45 in Alberta. 
But Ill- I prefer Ill- illegal. Did you say legal? Yeah, it's illegal to be below that because you just start wounding animals. But I mean, oh my god, I just have like almost twice as much energy as in my arrow as that. So if I hit a shoulder blade, it'll go through it or small things like that, and it increases my range. You know, I'm super comfortable out to about forty. But after another season or two with with that, I could probably get that out to sixty or sixty five. Yards. Yeah, with that, with that, I was taking hundred yard shots today, but I lost those arrows. But it goes yeah. hundred yards, no problem. And I went over the target both times. Wow! Well, it was a fun day. It was a great outing. I feel great. You know what it is? It's I, a beautiful I think weather. It's, yeah, it's be, weather was beautiful. It was a little hot, if anything, but it's really just getting outside of that cell phone range. Like where we go, there's no fucking cell service here. Outside of that fucking 4g 5g lte field that's just there all the time i can feel the refreshment of it coming back in wow yeah you can notice it it takes a few hours of being out there before you notice it but i'm I'm just starting to notice being out of cell service because that's like the first good out of cell service outing i've had this year every time i've gone camping i've gone down at that lake there's still cell service i still got like four bars there the whole time i'm camping i haven't really been out in the bush yet this year yeah. And it's a huge difference. And even where we went, go and shoot those moose, right? You have cell service everywhere there. But when we get out in the mountains, you don't have it. I notice a big difference. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. That's interesting. Anyway, what do you got? Well, I got a couple quotes. Um, and I've, I've kind of, you know, I was doing the research on this guy about pyrodyne. And uh, so I, I don't have... Um, a project operation that was going to be this pendant was going to be my project operation. But fell apart. Um, no, I did it. I did it. Well, I just didn't ask it. for a jingle, or you know, I kind of just winged it. Huh. Well, good job. I, I do. I do. Okay. I mean, I do have something here. Okay. Let me let me just read this. You, I don't need a jingle for it. It's just an expansion. What's um, an expansion? I'm totally winging this here. Um, this is about we this, can't tell. This, the, the manual that was given to somebody by an ET to make these pendants and, or this technology. Maybe it's in general. Um, so ET, this is, that's an ET pendant? Well, it's based on technology from them, I believe, yeah. I don't believe uh, that. The second part of the See, promise this is, is coming true before my eyes. I don't believe uh, that for a second. That's that's okay. You don't have to believe it. In the winter uh, or spring you know. of 1985, my very first live spaceship landing contact was arranged after the culmination of a magical time with a member of the Earth's resistance movement. Resistance movement. This was a military special forces brother who refused to work for the dark side and was rewarded with help from our space family. His name was Jim, and I owe him a great debt of gratitude. He was sent to act as my teacher at Gabriel Green's house. The ascended master, Hilarion, who is the Kohan of the fifth ray of concrete science and knowledge, sent Jim, who I consider my brother and teacher of light to me. Jim was instructed to teach me many things in the course of my short association. In the end, I was gifted with my first real open visit from Semjace. So they're talking about the spaceship that landed... I was with Jim, Gabriel Green, and Michael L. Legion. The spaceship landed 20 feet in front of me and my companions in a programmed contact. I had very emotional, simultaneous telepathic communication while the ship was throbbing and pulsing in a beautiful orange and reddish color. This contact contacted ended in me, never having seen another spaceship to know that they are real and that they are very physical beings who ride in spaceships made of matter and living light. This picture is a reverse-engineered Palladian spacecraft design shared with me by a man who had a company making such craft under contract with the U.S. government, Bob Lazar, has also given information on this Earth's secret space program craft. So it's like the sport model, basically. Um, my like second encounter with Sam Jays that I'm allowed to remember is when I was with Fred in the living room. So I think that's Fred Bell. Um, of his... In the living room of his house atop the Vortex, oh my God, Vortex, <laughs> in Laguna Beach. Things are going I was lying on the floor. 
And the next moment I was teleported to a mothership and standing inside and met Sam Jace herself. Many wonderful things and many amazing revelations were shared with me. And in that morning, I was returned to a different location in his living room with Fred by my side. You are the master now, he exclaimed. I could only watch in frustration as right before my eyes, most of my experiences were erased from my mind. I had all the memories before me and I watched helpless to stop the eraser that slowly step by step removed almost all my experience. I managed to keep one major memory and this is all I've or this is what I've held on to for all my life. All that remains of one of my most amazing days of my entire life is my remembrance of the promise that I made to participate in the process to awaken humanity to the best of my ability. Are you done? This, is, this goes on about no, the no. Hang on, hang on, hang on. This event would share the wonderful Roughly. healing technologies of light, color, and sound that were part of my individual awakening process. Um, I resubmitted. I'm just looking for when he actually got the book. From the alien? Yeah. I can't seem to find it here, so I'm going to have to look. Okay. I don't want to go too far into prepared. this contact encounter, but... Are you done? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll 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 stop it there and I'll go over it for next week if I find anything interesting. Let's call it homework for you. I feel like you need to wrap that up better. It's wrapped. That's what she said. It's the profound quote of the week. Darren, can you guess it? It's the profound quote of the week. Can you guess the human who spoke it or wrote it down? Pro what if it's not a human? Do you have an AI quote or an alien quote? Yeah, exactly. Uh, this is a human. I got two here. Same vein. Different the first one. guy. The basic wait, wait, same vein, different guy, or yeah, different guy, yeah. The basic tool for the manipulation of reality is the manipulation of words. If you can control the meaning of words, you can control the people who must use the George words. George Orwell. <laughs> close. <laughs> Fuck. Close. Well, wait, don't I'm always one. close. Don't ask don't answer that one. This is another one. Is it gonna be George Orwell again? There is no swifter route to the corruption of thought than through the corruption of language. George Orwell. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so who's the first one? Then let me think. Who else is is very Orwellian? Not I. Pretty, pretty close to our. Pretty close to our 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 our, our, our show. What? John McAfee. He's pretty close to our show. Like we we have a direct, almost a direct connection with the author of that quote. An almost direct connection, so we haven't I guess had that'd him be on. Indirect, I guess that'd be indirect. No, he's dead. Oh, he's dead. So have we had him on? No, but we had somebody that knows him very well on the show. That used to be married to him. Ooh, is it the like, person who uh, who killed? No, it wasn't that? No, <laughs> uh, the novel guy. Yeah, Philip yeah. K. Dick. Yeah. Ha. Nice one. Well, you, you kind of gave me a bunch of hints there. So, <laughs> Still, speaking of good. speaking of giving, you guys could give us a little value back away for getting your value from the five hundred and fifty eight podcasts we've given you for free. All still there for free. If you haven't listened to them all, feel free to go to the back catalog. Um, check them all out. Grandamerica.ca slash support. If you're getting some value from our little podcast here, if you want to send some value back our way, more important than ever in the dog days of summer. You know, if you guys could just find it, find a few minutes, head over, buck a month, two bucks a month, 10 bucks a month, 100 bucks a month, whatever you can afford to keep us going and keep us growing over here in Grand America. Of course, it is Graham's full time job now, rely on this and some audiobooks and a few other things we're doing to keep him going. So, America.ca slash support. This value for value model is still extremely important to our, to our, uh, to our existence over here. So if yeah, you do like totally. the show and you do want the show to stay around, it is important that you head over there and uh, sign up for a monthly or make a one-time donation or do something to throw some value back our way. If you can, when you can, we understand if you can't, lots you can't, 99% of you can't. So we need at least one or 2% of you to go over there today, sign up, 
for a monthly or make a one-time donation, please, pretty please. Anyway, you can also check out our other podcast over at GreatAmericaOutlaw.ca. Some more free content over there. 100 episodes now. Uh, AdultBrain.ca for all the audiobooks. We were talking Two books just came out. You want me to mention Two them quickly? Two books just came out. Well, Practical, the crowd's going to be out soon, too. Practical week. Occultism came out um, from H.P. Blavatsky. That's a really interesting little book, almost like a, almost like a, a new thought sort of self helpy kind of book. Lots of common sense in there. And also the other one was Our Story of Atlantis, which is um, written down by the, for the Hermetic Brotherhood. That's pretty interesting. And we got Chad a couple Atlantis. trips coming up with Randall Carlson down in the Scablands over at contact at the cabin.com. We got that trip in February coming up with THC over Greg Carbold over at the higher side chats and Owen Hunt and Brandon Powell and Joe Rube. All that would be fabulous time over at Mount Shasta in California. All that's over at contact at the cabin.com. So you check all that stuff out. It all helps. So what do you got? Is that it? I got the uh, Simon Shacks quick little bio here. Do you have one for Peter too? No, I don't have one for Patrick. Patrick. No. Yeah. Are you going to make one up? No, I'm not going to mention Patrick. Patrick made the Tychosium model. He's, oh, uh, he's I not think the, he's, he's, super, the, he's, he's a the computer the engineer. Computer whiz. Or he's, yeah, he's, yeah. he's a whiz. Yeah. He's a whiz. He's a whiz kid. Kid. And I can't wait to do. We'll let you guys know when the when the uh, when the video comes out. But the, check out this Tychosium. It's pretty cool. So uh, Simon is the lone author of this new interpretation of our solar system. Though many recent and less recent studies have contributed with clues towards this groundbreaking understanding, he's an independent researcher with no ties or affiliation with any entity whatsoever, and has conducted this decade-long study in perfect solitude on zero budget. He feels fortunate to have no academic credentials to speak of, as this handicap may well have facilitated my fresh and unbiased investigative research journey into the daunting realm of astronomy. He's 50% Norwegian, 50% Swede, living in Italy. So um, you can go to this website. I've got a link in the show notes because he's very open. You can email him. He's got an email in there. Um, uh, Yeah, they're very passionate about this research and the model that they've made there you go it's quite interesting all right guys enjoy the chat with patrick and simon Holmquist and Simon Shack of the Tycos Space Model. Welcome to Grimerica. Hello. Thank you, Graham. Thank you. Yeah, Pleasure it's great to here. talk to you guys. Yeah, this is going to be fun. We have lots of listeners that, that uh, are reading your books and loving uh, Tycosium and uh, lots of questions for you guys on this fascinating uh, concept oh. here. Mm, nice. We're ready. Yeah, I mean, let's. I mean, there's so much to dig into, so we have to be careful that we don't go down into too many weeds. But we also, you know, give enough descriptions here. We'll probably do like a video presentation later on for people, but this one will be audio only still. So what, like, let's let's talk. I mean, how do you how do you normally start explaining this to people at a high level so that we understand kind of without getting too too caught up in details, like what you guys have sort of uh, have done here with the, with this theory. Well, the first thing I would say, I would say to people uh, to describe what it is about, what the Tycho's model is about, is that it's, we are living in a binary system. 
and uh, which is composed by the Sun and Mars. They are two companions. Okay. And it, it's, it shouldn't sound so strange that we are in a binary system because we have discovered in later years that practically all the stars are binary. Around and this us. is accepted, right, by mainstream? They say 85%. 85%. I mean, they be, but they've been saying that since the 80s. Right, right. So, but then, since then, they've discovered day after day more and more and more binary stars. Only two or three years ago, <laughs> they discovered that our closest star, Proxima, also has a companion. So you can imagine how difficult it is to find these companions. They're very small sometimes. Sometimes you can get two stars which are almost, you know, like Alpha Centauri, the next closest star, that's a binary too. And the two uh, components of Alpha Centauri, A and B, they are, they are as big as the sun. So that you can, in a good telescope, you can see them, the two of them. But without telescope, they look like one star. So I have I do have a question though. Uh, sorry to interrupt already, but it kind of has to do with this binary system. I mean, T Bone Shuffle, a of, of listener of the show, was kind of asking um, if if you look at he says the binary stars are supposed to rotate each or one around themselves. So he he's kind of got this picture in his mind that they 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 rotate around themselves. But in in our model, it seems like. They don't do that. In your model, it seems like sort of Mars rotates sort of more around the sun than... No, it does. Mars, it, it, the only problem to figure, to mean to get uh, used to that motion we have in our system is that Mars uh, only gets every, every second year, every other year, it will be on the other side of the sun. Whereas one would expect the every it would do it every year, right? It's just okay. a, a one to two ratio. So that's why it looks like that way. But it is a perfectly classic. Well, it's not a classic binary systems because there are millions of different types of binary systems. But it is a binary system, and and binary system. Yes, they they do rotate. At the what you can how you can define a binary system is two objects revolving around their own their their, their common common barry center but they oh, revolve okay. around, they revolve around nothing usually there is nothing in the middle but in our case the earth is for some reason stuck there in the middle it's in, in the barry center probably okay of okay. this dance Thank so you. Uh, yeah so i mean the, the the best example we have of a binary system it's a, a, the brightest star in our sky which is which is serious of course Sirius is the absolutely brightest star we have, and they only discovered in late 19th century that it had a companion, because it's so small. And uh, Sirius B, which they found, finally, is <laughs> the first thing I looked up when I started this research many years ago. I wondered how big is Sirius B in relation to its mother, you know, the big one, Sirius A. Well. Hold on to your seats because it's exactly as small as Mars is in relation to the Sun. Um, to explain easily, uh, the Sun is 205 times bigger than Mars, and Sirius A is 205 times bigger than Sirius B, which is maybe an enormous coincidence. But we have then the proof that such a small companion can and does revolve the way I'm saying that Sun and Mars are revolving. So no one can come and say that, that that's not possible because Sirius, the Sirius uh, pair does that. And, and in later years, some, a French team uh, did a long study uh, trying to see if there was another object because there were, it was suspected that another object, a third object was in the Sirius system. And although they couldn't see it, they could calculate that, yes, there should be a serious C. Wow. But we cannot see it because it's too close to the big one, and so it's lost in the glare. But that would be the corresponding uh, uh, planet uh, of Earth. I mean, it would be the, could be the twin of Earth. If we one day find serious C in some special telescope we might find that it's a it's a maybe a twin of earth it's so a would that be considered prospect. a trinary system then or no they never different. they never 
they never be considered seriously a trinary system. There are trinary systems. There are quintuple systems like our, our, our North North Pole star, Polaris. It's a quintuple system. So there are, as I said before, there are many types types of binary systems. But all of the stars we know of, at least all the closest stars, they are all binary. So it, it becomes really statistically absurd to think that our sun would be the only you know the only single guy <laughs> in our universe so obviously if the sun's locked in a binary orbit with mars and then it looks yeah. like they're they're orbiting around us or is the model just simplified to do that and the earth's kind of rotating with them at the same time is it is it the earth in the dance or does it seem more like it's around us and does this obviously this is we're looking at talking about something different than gravity at this point well, Earth moves, but very slowly. It's, uh, as I said, it's kind of stuck in the very center, but it does move very, very slowly. Uh, how fast does it move? Well, uh, I've calculated that it goes at one mile per hour, 1.6 kilometers an hour. Because how did I do that? Well, I was able to estimate the uh, width of our orbit which is not an orbit around the sun, as in the Copernican system. It's an internal orbit, uh, internal to this dance of the sun and Mars. And I call it the PVP orbits. The PVP orbit, which stands for Polaris, our, our current North Star, then Vega, our North Star in 12,000 years, and then Polaris back again. So it's PVP. It That's doesn't the, really look that we, much different, though, right? With the like, with the you've got it set up now. It looks like so that we're orbiting the sun, and it all sort of looks. It it really just snaps into that classic model, looking really quickly. You know that that that's super interesting. Well, it's the sun that it revolves around the Earth uh, anyway, so it, it is different in that sense. Uh, it's the sun that's moving, and and you know all the stars again. They have a local orbit. What's the local orbit? That's what I like to call it. Uh, all all this sun, the other sun. If we do agree that all the stars are suns, because that's I think we do agree on that. Well, we can see them. Well, all. it depends who you ask, but for the most you, part, yeah, we agree on that. Part. Yes, <laughs> yes. But okay, let's let's try and agree with that. And then you will, uh, if you look at, uh, let's say, you look at Sirius, as, uh, as I mentioned before. That takes 50 years to do one. They, they employ 50 years to do one uh, rotation, revol revolution around each other. Uh, our system, for them to revolve around each other, Sun and Mars, it's two years and something, two years and a little bit more. That's when Mars returns to the opposition, which means it's on the other side of Earth um, in relation to the Sun. That's when Mars comes in opposition and in, when it comes closest to Earth. And then, then that's also the moment when it starts going retrograde. Because as you can see on the Tychosium, I really encourage everyone to go to the Tychosium simulator, which Patrick has. That's TS, TS .tyco space, right? Yes. That's really important to uh, get familiar with to start understanding how this works out. Because so it I'll looks get, like yeah. it doesn't really change, like it wouldn't change really any of the measurements, you know, so that it could explain how we can still well, get see, to Mars. It's, 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 the thing is that it does change something. It resolves some amazingly grave problems that the Copernican system have and which I explain in the book. And because the Copernican system violates the most basic laws of perspective. That's when Mars can align with a certain star in 707 days, and then suddenly it aligns with the same star in only 546. I mean, how would that work out in the Copernican system? Yeah, seven well, times in a row, and then it and then it reverts to that. Exactly, yeah. Graham. So you yeah, see, I, I see here. I see you've read the little the book. So yeah, I try. I'm tr uh, yeah, I tried to yeah. <laughs> brush up on this as much yeah, as yeah. my as much as my brain can handle this paradigm. Well, chart, it's I not mean. it's not so complicated. I mean, the basic things we 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 don't have to go into the details, right here. But the basic things is that okay, that we are a binary system. I find it extremely logical. 
it's statistically logical that we are moving slowly it's i of, i feel it's logical too why would be why would be we be moving at 90 times the speed of sound because that's what they're telling us that we are right now moving at 107,000 kilometers an hour that's 90 that's mach 90 <laughs> okay so that's really fast so instead earth is moving at one mile per hour in this system and it might explain why, why we have life and, and oceans and, and, and calm uh, small calm winds sometimes and maybe some tornadoes sometimes but um, it's it's a very very calm planet and um, I think that's also makes sense I think so, too. I mean, the thing that always wonders me is how we aren't just smashing into more shit all the time if we're just flying around at, you know, a hundred and some thousand miles an hour. You'd think <laughs> it's just like you're bound, bound to run into some shit. Yeah, right. Oh, and, you know, imagine, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, imagine, I mean, there, there are constant meteor showers, you know, crashing into our atmosphere. So here's the thing that I, I was wondering about quite a bit that comes comes back to like why the Earth why is it the why is it closer to the Barry Center or why is why is it the Earth is it just a coincidence that the Earth is the Earth and it happens to be kind of the center of the system or um, do you know what I mean like is that does that have any does that play into how the Earth is sort of made it developed and then. And then that brings in the moon into question too. Why is the moon kind of like the drive shaft of this whole thing? Like, cause that kind of brings into like, it, it kind of makes everybody think all automatically of uh, way back when they thought the earth was the center of the universe. And it brings back sort of almost like a negative connotation with religion and with uh, this kind of like <clears throat> anthropomorphism in a way, right. Where earth is the center, but I, I can't really articulate this, but I feel like that's not the case with, with your model. It just happens to be that way. Yeah, well, it's a hard question to answer. I mean, how is like uh, trying to answer uh, well, how did life start on Earth? It's why is Earth there and why does it have... But the moon... No, but I guess is there any physical, like, is it, is it, a, is it a magnetic thing? Is it a, you know, I, I may, may, maybe putting it into context because I think what you're saying here is that Mercury and Venus are moons of the sun, right? Yes. So that might yes. play a role. Ven Venus, Venus and Mercury are the moons of the sun because they always, they never come in opposition. They always stay uh, everywhere around the sun and they show the same face to the sun all the time. They're tightly locked. Like the, to like the moon is to like us. Like the moon is to us. But you mentioned the moon uh, briefly, uh, which is uh, the, um, uh, yeah, it's kind of the drive shaft of the whole system as I, as I explained in the book. Because what I found out uh, was quite amazing is that the moon, first of all, the moon is only, it's just one, it's uh, it's as big as one fourth of the earth. So it's a huge moon in, uh, compared to other moons. So it's a very special moon we have. I mean, all the other moons are really much smaller than their hosts. So the moon is pre pretty special here in our solar does, system. Does that include moons outside of our solar system too? Absolutely. I mean, um, I mean, the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, they're much smaller than their hosts, right? And there are, there are dozens of them. They have, I think Jupiter is 70 and Saturn has, a, has just as maybe 70 as well. I mean, like 80, 70. They have lots of moons, the, the big uh, gas giants. But we have only one moon and it's pretty big. It's just one fourth of, of our Earth's uh, diameter. And then I found out, so I found out that, and then I, I passed the word to Patrick, but I found out that the moon has this uh, average period, which is this synodic period. That's the time it takes for the moon to return facing the sun. Okay. That's 29.22 days, according to my best calculations. And if you multiply that number, 29.22 by 4, you get exactly Mercury's period, which is another moon, which is 116.88 days. If you multiply it by 20, you get Venus period, which is 584.4 days. If you multiply this moon's uh, average period by 25, you get Mars, 
And by 150, you get Jupiter. Uh, by 375, you get Saturn, and so on, all the way to Neptune. Round multiples of the moon's periods. For goodness sake. Well, that, well that, there does that, seem to no be all has, these weird... No like, one has noticed that before. There does seem to be all these weird correlations between like our moon and the rotations and all that, too, that are pretty crazy. So, I mean, that... You know, uh, that makes it less know, crazy if it's happening at scale. You know, you know, Darren, why would the moon have this fantastic relationship with all the other uh, planets if it was just one of many moons going around uh, around us the th- in the third lane around the sun? I mean, now instead it makes more sense because it's central to the whole system. The moon and Earth are central. And that makes it more plausible that the moon is some kind of central drive shaft, as I call it. And that, and that just, do you think that's a random thing? It, well, no, I'm, I'm saying that it's not, it can't be a random thing. I'm saying I, that I, that I, must mean something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. See? I don't, think, I don't think random was the right word in my question, but I, 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 it's just weird that it's the earth, right? Like, is it... Uh, you know, I, I feel like it's... Well, it's, uh, it depends how it, you look at it, because I can look at it in a way that it's not weird that it's the Earth, because maybe at the center of all these systems is some sort of life-containing planet, you know, or any of the life-containing planets are the ones that are at the center of these systems. It yeah. can still, like, yeah. be that way without Earth being special, you know what yeah. I mean? But yeah, it gets, yeah. fuck, I mean, well, it reeks okay. of intelligent yeah. design, too, Unless it, and it and it kind of like borders on some sort of electrical sort of mag, magnetic theory. So, what is the mechanism you, that you think is holding all this in place? You see, I I leave that for later. I I concentrated on devising a geometrically possible solar system. Geometrics comes before physics in my world. You don't put the, the cart in front of the horse. You don't start with, well, that, with uh, physical speculations before you even have understood how the, the things move. For God's not sake. just your, not just your world. I mean, the ancients put geometry before everything as well. Yes, I mean, they said the yes. number one science is geometry. Everything else comes out of that. Yes, and what do the masons love to hide? The, the G, you know, <laughs> geometry. Yeah. So no, I mean, uh, you could you could put it. This way, I mean, before you start to figure out why something moves, you need to figure out how it moves. I mean, how it moves geometrically. And 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 I know that sounds amazing, but we, we haven't got this uh, right in, in, uh, in thousands of years, <laughs> actually. Because, I mean, as you, you were into, Graham, uh, before the, the 17th century, uh, we had, uh, uh, I don't know, the, a classic geocentrical view of the universe. We considered the Earth to be the center of the universe and everything moved around it. And then the, what you could call the, the Copernican revolution uh, came. And uh, Earth, and, and we understood that no, it's not uh, the stars that revolve around us in 24 hours. Uh, it's the Earth that that uh, that rotates. So, but but I mean, I think what has happened here is that you go from thesis to antithesis, and and now we went a little bit too far. Because, of course, the Earth rotates in, in, in 24 hours. But uh, as, and as Simon uh, explains so crystal clear in his book that you most easily can find if you just go to the, the web address tycos.space, is that it's, it's not geometrically possible that the Earth revolves around the sun. And, and that's I know that's hard because uh, when I I started school, the the one of the first thing I learned is that <laughs> the Earth uh, revolves around the Sun. So so this is uh, this is a big thing, and it's it raises so many other questions. But as as you know, Graham and Darren, and and the listeners of this podcast, is that within science 
sometimes the scientists are not very open to to new facts and actual observations and, and we can find this in history we can find it in medicine but we can also find it in astronomy and physics they yeah, are no exception yeah, they, to this if, if 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 they get new evidence they'll just discard it if it doesn't meet their current paradigm the current theory of the paradigm i mean charles yes. fort i don't know if you guys are aware that charles fort pushed back about uh, against the astronomers quite a bit he had a couple books, Low and New Lands, where he he talks about the parallax, and we'll get into that later. That's a whole separate separate thing. But he was he was really railing against them because they would they would uh, make all these predictions and they wouldn't come true, but there would be no consequences. Yet they'd see something cross over the moon, like a an anomalous object cross over the moon, but they wouldn't even take that into account in their theory. So, you know, they were very exclusive. Um, exclusive in their in their you know acceptation of data and it wouldn't change their paradigm yet they were also wrong about all kinds of things uh, he really he really showed that um in the early 1900s um yeah very mm -hmm. very interesting so mm -hmm. so how did how did so if you mentioned that that the sun, it's not possible for the for the earth to rotate around the sun geometrically how did you how do you guys explain that to people well, let's uh, explain in my book. Patrick, please. Yeah, yeah, if I may. Uh, actually, Tycho Brahe explained it very well in the in the 17th century or, or, or the 16th century, I don't remember. But uh, and and uh, this uh, has been uh, addressed or attacked in several ways, but but uh, that doesn't those uh, counter argument doesn't hold as as Simon explains so very well in his book because uh, as the laws of geometry, if you if you draw a straight line, and then you you draw another line that's parallel with that line. And they intersect the same object. Then the conclusion is that the, the diameter of that object must be uh, as what? wide as the distance between these two parallel lines. And as we can confirm when we observe the skies, is that if we uh, uh, put uh, a star in our line of sight in December, and at the same time of night, uh, at the same time of night, when we watch that star, when it, when you know when the Earth rotates and it gets in into our line of sight, it will be at the same position. So the only, I mean, so what we must conclude then is that all stars then have to be as wide as the diameter of Earth's orbit around the Sun, which is about 300 million kilometers. And that doesn't make any yes, sense. You, you, you forgot to mention... Uh, if you yeah, go months. ahead, Simon. You, you can explain it better. Just, no, just uh, you, f you forgot to mention that if you look at, uh, at 12 o'clock in December, and then you wait six months... Right, and, right. And then, for, the, for the max, oh. uh, for the and max, then in yeah. June, in June you look again at the same time of night, and you will see Mars sometimes, sometimes facing that same star, and mm. that this happens because that can only be visualized and understood watching the Tychosium that Patrick has uh, brilliantly helped me construct so it's yeah yeah really but Simon, let, let me this. continue in in order to sure. get your head around this uh, sure. why why the 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 earth can't actually revolve around the sun i mean it's it's, it's explained in crystal clear in your book and because i mean this is a recognized geometrical problem so what they had to find them in order to make a heliocentric uh, system possible with the sun in the middle. They had to find parallax. And what is a stellar parallax? And what is stellar parallax? Well, that is that you actually can observe a slight movement uh, between the stars or, or a parallax between the stars uh, during the course of a year. And this they have found. And what they 
what, what the the only thing there can be in a heliocentric system is uh, positive stellar parallax. But the problem is that they have found about as much positive as negative stellar parallax. And that is not possible in a heliocentric system. So this they don't talk about. They, every negative parallax is, is called a measuring error or, or something called proper motion. Also, none, no parallax as well that you guys mentioned. In your- yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes, yes, yes. Because it's, it's, what what, I've, what Simon has discovered is that the, yes, we have parallax. Yes, the Earth moves in relation to the stars, but it does. This is not a confirmation that it moves around the sun. It is confirmation that it moves in a slow orbit of itself of only 1.6 kilometers per hour or or one mile, while the entire solar system moves around the Earth and follows the Earth in this slow orbit. As I like to explain uh, without images, uh, the the parallax uh, question is, uh, if if we think in a Copernican way, I mean, if you think that we are going around the sun, you will have to imagine that you always see, uh, if you're going around, if the, if the earth was, were, was a car, you would always see the stars in your right-hand window and, and the sun in the left-hand window, right? Okay, yep, yep. I mean, at 12 o'clock in the midnight, okay? So it would always be the same. The stars would be on the same side of the car. And so th- that's why they, that they could be only positive parallax if the Copernican oh, right, system okay. was right. Yeah. Whereas in this Tychos, when you get familiar with it, you will realize that we only move, we, we move like a straight line for like a thousand years. In a, in a thousand year period, we kind of move in a straight line because we really slowly, slowly go around our orbit. It takes 25,000 years. So you could call it almost a straight line what we are doing in a thousand years, okay? So, if since we're going in a, in a straight line, we can see the stars in the, in the left-hand window and in the right-hand window, and therefore, some of them will go in a, have a negative parallax, and some will have positive. And in the tables, of official tables of NASA, ESA, and all the official, they have 25% of negative Star, parallax, uh, stars with negative parallax, 25 mm, approximately of positive, but the rest, the remaining 50 ha- have no, no detect- detectable parallax. And that is also explained because these are the stars we are going t- towards or away from. Because if you look in, in your front window, you will not see any parallax of a closer star in relation to the further stars. Right, right. And the same in your back back window. They will not you will not see any parallax. So that's why we have 50% of the stars in the catalogs which have no parallax. They haven't found any parallax for 50%. But then it, it gets more complicated because it depends on when they take the measurements and so on and so forth. And that's also explained in the book with graphics because you only can understand this with graphics. You know, you have to look at it. You have to get familiar with the dynamics, with the geometry. And then it should be, as Patrick likes to say, it should become crystal clear. Is this, is this why um, Kepler had so, such a problem with Mars for so many years? Because mm. who would ever <laughs> think that it was binary? I mean, is that oh. why? <laughs> Poor Kepler. He must have suffered so much. He spent five years trying to figure out what Mars was doing because he was looking at the data, observational data of his master, Tycho Brahe. Because Kepler, remember, he was just an assistant. He just came, knocked on the door of Tycho Brahe and said, hey, I'm a good mathematician. I can help you out, maybe. Yeah, I try to understand what Mars is doing because I, I can't figure it out. So he, he, he said, okay, I'm going to do this in two weeks. I'll, I'll explain. But it took him five years. And what did he have to do? He had to do some mathematics, as I like to call it, <laughs> to make it work. Yeah, yes. and, he had, and he had to cheat. 
He had to she cheat, cheated. and that is, he literally that is cheated. confirmed in peer-reviewed science that Kepler cheated. Mm-hmm. He didn't use the actual observations of Tycho Brahe. He fudged the numbers in his uh, Astronomia Nova, and, and that well. is uh, <laughs> that is printed. Yes, yes, <laughs> in yes. in the nineties, I think was it. I in mean, you, you describe it in your book. Eighty-seven was uh, Professor Donahue, the guy who uh, finally yeah. translated uh, his big um, book into English, and he he, he found out this this uh, incredible discrepancies uh, between his his stated uh, figures and his conclusions. So he, Kepler is is um, is a declared fraud. It kind of helps your case, though, because it was Mars that had the issue, right? Because Mars is the binary. Half, yes, right? so, of course. Yes. I mean, yeah. Yes, Mars yeah. was the problem. Mars was the the problem. The problem, yeah. 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 Hmm. What, what about, I just had this weird question, too. I might as well ask you now. Like, the ancients used to talk about seven planets all the time, right? Mm-hmm. Um, how does does this affect uh, or does this co- corroborate? How because I was always trying to figure out well, what seven planets are they talking about because they didn't really know about Neptune at the time or maybe they did or or um, Uran- Ur- Uranus <clears throat> as well at at some point. So mm-hmm. um, I thought well they're talking about the star. I mean sorry the sun and the moon and you know Mars Mercury Venus Jupiter um, Saturn. <clears throat> but I wonder if this. Uh, I wonder how much of the ancient ancient astronomy this corroborates or how much they knew about this system before it kind of got lost in the scientific age. Well, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I, I think I'm, I'm, you know, I'm among those who think that they had lots of knowledge that's been lost over time. So, yeah, it's a, it's a, but it's, you know, it's a, it's a, an interesting subject, but, um, and, but I'm sure that, for instance, I was helped by uh, some figures that the Maya, the Maya astronomers had figured out. Um I was helped in my research because they had found, for instance, that 29.22 periods of the, the moon. Uh, they were very interested in Venus, uh, uh, and because Venus is really the most, it, 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 it's the closest planet. It comes the closest. Uh, it comes closest to Earth. Venus. Yeah, I was looking at that. In the one swing, it looks like it's not much more than like maybe double a moon orbit. It's it's. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Venus is almost as, as as large as Earth. Okay. So now that's a, a question I had. So now, when I'm watching in this Tycho's model over here, it looks like, you know, I don't know how often, but it's. I think I had it set at one, a year. So it's like once every seven years, maybe uh, Venus is very close to Earth. Like, you know, maybe only under a million under a million uh, miles every 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 1.6 years it's it within a, so now is that the same thing that the conventional models telling us that every 1.7 years egypt is that same yes, distance yes, away? Yes, yeah yes, that's yes, what yes. i thought that's but what, what i thought have, because yes, when i, I click this to make the sun the center it looks yeah. identical almost to the conventional model i mean no, it's, it's really... super close you could see how you yeah. could get them confused or how how we could make that mistake so do you think that this is just a mistake that we're caught up in, or do you think there's people that know what's up, or you know, do you think this is just hubris of the past, or? Well, I, I really don't want to okay. to say that uh, I know why or how. I'm I, I'm just satisfied that I have uh, a model that works perfectly, and <laughs> and yeah, I mean, yes, we can conjecture all night. Uh, who, who, if it's been, you know, it's a conspiracy theory that uh, keeping us from us. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I tend to go there now. I mean, because there are so many things that are have been strange. Why, why, for instance, aren't they telling us that all stars are binary? They are trying to, to you know, obfuscate this thing. Every, everyone should know by now that all stars are binaries. And is there other stars that are binary with planets? I think you said there were, right? Like that other thing that the other one that's the exact same, um, whatever it was, 250 to 1 or 265 to 1, I forget. But is that, that's also like a, an instance of a star orbiting, uh, 
I guess, a rocky planet instead of another star? Look, look, if we were, okay, let's go there. Let's go on. The definition of planets and stars. We have to revise this definition because uh, there is um, a school of thought now, a modern school of thought, uh, which is called uh, stellar metamorphosis. And they are saying that, that all all the bodies in our universe are stars in different stages of their evolution. So maybe Mars was <laughs> yeah. Mars was a star. I mean, Mars is red, and the the vast majority of stars in our skies are red dwarfs. So why couldn't Mark, Mars be a red dwarf? It is red when we look at it closely. Um, why couldn't it be a you know it's a, an old star, much older than the sun? Earth could also be an old star, but older than Mars, and the moon would be even older. But, okay, we, this, is, this is subject to further study, but <clears throat> we, we don't know why, would, why do we call planets planets and moons moons and uh, stars stars. Well, we can rightly call moons I'm moons just, yeah. because they, are, they behave very, very in particular manner. They always show the same face to their hosts. And they rotate around their axis extremely slowly. The moon uh, only rotates, it only rotates at 16 kilometers an hour. Uh, uh, and then, <laughs> listen to this, uh, Mercury and Venus rotate three times and six times slower. Exactly three times and six times slower. Wow. So is there a niner in there too? If I remember so, Tesla, so Tesla a, said there's that. There's a the resonance th between the three moons. There is a wow. resonance between the moon, Mercury, and Venus, which I call three moons. And that's maybe, do you, I wonder if that is like that recipe for life. I remember Tesla had that quote that was said, if three, we six, could understand nine, the yeah. three, the, the relationship between three, six, and nine, we could understand mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. secret of the universe. Yep. yep. But mm -hmm. I thought the other moons around Jupiter, for example, didn't show the same face throughout the whole orbit. I thought they. I thought the moon, our moon, was the only one that did that. No, 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 no. Well, I don't know about all the moons. The tidally Jupiter, locked. But, you know, you know, Jupiter even have moons that go in either direction. Some go in one direction, some go in the other direction. So it's a bit different with the gas planets, I guess. I yeah. Some, yeah. yeah, exactly. And then also it, it depends on uh, what uh, uh, model you have of the, the solar system. Because if you have a heliocentric model, uh, in order for it to work with observations regarding the planets, uh, then Mercury, for example, would have to accelerate and deaccelerate with about, I think it's 36% of its speed every 96 days. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Mercury is speeding and braking and speeding and braking a lot during 90 <laughs> days. Yeah. But in the, uh, and uh, as yeah. uh, opposed to, to uh, Tycho's, uh, the Tycho's model, where Mercury moves at a constant speed in a circular orbit. That, uh, to me, that feels a bit more uh, plausible and, and physical, to be honest. Yeah, you know, what, what, we, <laughs> what you need to realize, um, I mean, you, when I say you, you, you um, newbies to the Tigers, is <coughs> that in spite of the fact that all the planets and moons and whatever we want to call them in the Tychos move at constant speeds and circular orbits. Yes. It all, they all match with observations. Right. And I was just looking at this model as we're talking. I'm watching sort of, you know, Mercury go around the sun. And now I see exactly what you're saying, because as from from a heliocentric point, it would be. It would be slowing down as it go, as it comes around the sun's orbit towards Earth or whatever. It looks like it's slowing down and speeding up and all that. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. in your model, it's just going around steadily around the sun. Yep. Yeah, yep. I see it very visually yep. expressive in this in this Tychosium. Ah, but you know, and, and you know, Graham. There's been so much debate around Mercury 
within astronomy. I mean, that was the, the kind of quarrel or, or heated debate during the early 19th century when, when Einstein came up with his uh, theory of relati- relativity. And that was po- to solve this uh, problem with Mercury. <laughs> So we figured out that light bent. So Mercury oh, wasn't wow. actually where we observed it. It was somewhere else. We just saw it in a <laughs> place or kind of. But but that is also explained very well and in detail in, in Simon's book. So so go read it. <laughs> yes, actually, actually the bank Einstein's theory about Mercury in uh, half a page or something <laughs> in my book. <laughs> Because it can be shown that the little discrepancy, it was all about... Uh, the um, uh, anomalous precession of Mercury, you know, like 0.43 arc seconds, it's a very small amount that Mercury seemed to be in the wrong place. Well, that is simply because they calculated it with the idea that we are going around the sun, yeah. whereas we are not going around the sun. And that 0.43 is exactly one unit of Mercury's motion and so they were just discussing about this because the copernican heliocentric system is wrong exactly so again they're just taking that they're squeezing it into their own uh, own theory yes right? and they're having to take all so, the stuff that doesn't fit and just squeeze it in because they don't want to change the no they the got einstein model. to come up with an incredibly incredibly uh, complicated theory that it would be due to the gravity that bends lights and uh, einstein was just one of well, the many that tried to save the copernican from its impending collapse because it had problems it had problems for 100 years they tried to measure the, the speed of earth you know michelson and morley experiments very sophisticated experiments they couldn't find that enormous speed of 90 times the speed of sound which they were expecting they couldn't find anything well they did find some little speed though and that little speed i explain also in the book can be um, calculated to be exactly 1.6 kilometers an hour. I kid you not. I, which I is a mile, mean, which I mean might explain why the Egyptians were using the mile. You know, the mile is, seems to be fairly yeah, sacred. There we, yes, there we go to more more advanced esoteric thoughts. But yes, maybe, you know. Well, speaking maybe. of advanced esoteric thoughts, there's also this thing... Um, because I'm not a flat earth guy, you know, you get these flat earth guys, um, it's a bit much for me, but I mean, this seems to be a nice sort of marriage of the two because there's something fucking crazy going on with the moon. And we just had a show with another guy where we were talking about, you know, maybe the earth is growing and the timelines are changing and, you know, all of a sudden earth being at the middle and, and maybe being uh, a very important part of the system might lend credence to why it's growing uh, because it's sort of like the valve at the center of the thing. And if the moon's sort of important to it and the sun's important to it. Now I haven't gotten into the esoteric numbers behind the Mars relationship to the system, but I know that the moon, the sun and the earth get crazy. Like, you know, you got the thing, I forget all the things, but you can, and and you'll have to look this up. I'm um, the numbers are all out there, but if you take like, you know, the size of the Earth, the size of the diameter of the moon compared to its distance to Earth, it's 109 times. If you do the same thing from the Earth to the sun, it's 109 mm-hmm. times. So there seems to be this 109 or 108. It's somewhere mm-hmm. in between 108 and 109 that the ancients, you know, we're always talking about that 108 number. And then when you get into the moon and the Earth relationship, how, you know, they're different sizes, but they seem the same size in the sky. It takes the moon, you know, exact. It takes the moon exactly twenty seven point three days to do a full rotation, and the moon is twenty seven point three percent the size of the Earth. So, I mean, you start looking at that, and I mean, I've gone either way where I'm like, well, maybe the moon is homemade, and then I'm like, no, no, you know what? It's all just a bunch of crazy NASA Nazi occultists, and they're just making the numbers up, and they want them to relate that way. But you know, when I'm back into this model. You know, if the moon, the sun, and the earth are all pivotal pieces of the system, then it would make sense that they might have to have these relationships with each other. And I would, yes, Darren, I would hazard Darren, to guess that Mars fits into that as well. Darren, I, I, I don't want to interrupt you, but here is another pair of numbers uh, uh, you can chew on. 
which I've not read anywhere. I've just, I mean, no, no, nobody's talking about it. But it's a fact that the moon, the period that it takes to go around Earth from star to star, you know, you understand? That's the sidereal period of the moon. It's 27.3 days, okay? It takes 27.3 days for the moon to return facing the same star. Well, what do you what do you know the sun has a 27.3 rotation around its axis <laughs> so and that's a carrington number which no one speaks about because they say yeah i know the sun has different differential speeds at the top it rotates slower and or, or, or in the middle but they they never talk about this 27.3 carrington number but 27.3 is the average uh, rotation of the sun and the average revolution of the moon for god's sake so they must be this must be like a clockwork you know and I'm saying that the moon is the the, the central uh, uh, drive shaft. Because, you know, why would the moon have this relationship with the sun again if it was just one of many moons around uh, all of these planets we have? Why? It makes much more sense if the moon is central with us in relation to the rest of the system. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it really does. It really does without, I mean, so what do you think? What? Let's get, let's, you know, let's get there. Is it, do you think it's intelligent design or do you think it's like, uh, <laughs> do you think it's closer to a simulation, a, a simulation or into the oh. electric universe sort of model? Because all three of them could sort of carry out those relationships. But I mean, it's hard to rule out intelligent design just with fucking everything. That's one of Mike's question too. He's got a couple questions in here. We've already answered. Uh, I hate that question, really, guys. <laughs> but, uh, I, I will just okay. I will just um, plunge and say it's a magnetic system. It's magnets, and magnets uh, probably behave in such a clockwork fashion, and uh, it's magnetic phenomena we have. And uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I think don't want it's to go no. It's important to to keep things uh, apart. I'd say because I mean we can only answer so much uh, with science, but I mean we 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 can figure out uh, how how the solar system is configured. I'd say, and we can figure out a few other things using science and geometry and logic. But we haven't done a very good job. <laughs> we have went from uh, thesis to antithesis and 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 kind of miss the mark and if that is intentional or not well that we can speculate on but i mean what what we can't figure out is is uh, the metaphysics i mean if you you say i mean and and we love to speculate about this is uh, are we living in a simulation or but but i mean uh that we can't figure out, and it does. Actually, I, I don't think it matters much because it's it's real to us, regardless. So this is <laughs> this is real, and this is life. Yeah. So, well, I like the magnetic to me, and the electrical are the same thing because I think it's sort of a different sort of. It seems to me like electric electricity and magnetism are sort of two sort of sides of the same coin maybe you know they sort of seem to work together and that's what yeah, tesla yeah, seems to point to too yeah. and yeah. it always i've always sort of seemed like it could be a magnet thing the reason the moon's always right there is because it, it ain't getting any fucking further away because it's not an orbit thing it's locked with us in some way yeah. the whole yeah. thing's locked together as some sort yeah. of a cog so the ancients yeah. always had a thing with saturn too do you guys find anything weird in the relationship of saturn to earth in the in the tycho system uh, uh so many people like to talk about Saturn and I haven't found anything special with Saturn uh, apart from the fact that it's it's also goes round in a perfect multiple of the moon the under 75 times the 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 time that the moon takes for uh, returning in front of the sun that's th that's Saturn's period period and Saturn Saturn returns mind you exactly 
in uh, what is it now? Twenty twenty-five point <laughs> five. Eighty-four uh, years. I mean, it, it does one one revolution in uh, no 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 thirty. Sorry, thirty thirty years. Well, not exactly thirty years, but very really close. And and uh, Jupiter in twelve years, but then Uranus in eighty-four years exactly. It returns to the same place in the sky, and Neptune in 165 years. Exact multiples of the sun's one-year revolution. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it's really, it, see, it really is a clockwork. And mm. why is it like that? The, the question is not why is it like that. The question is why has no one realized this? Well, because there are some small discrepancies they can figure out, and that's given by our small motion. We are moving, we are still moving a little bit. Earth is moving by 14,000 kilometers a year. And those small discrepancies make them say, well, it's not perfectly, these are not perfect multiples. It's not. So this, this thing I found, the only, I, I want to be humble and say I've only done one discovery really and that's the pvp orbit um i've just yeah, added that to Tycho Brahe's system <clears throat> yeah but that's was... one of one uh, one hell of the piece of the puzzle to be frank uh, simon and oh, i mean well. with this you solve uh, quite a few uh, actually great astronomical problems and and i'm saying great because that's why, how one of them is named uh, i mean i was thinking of well we don't have any special thing about Saturn, but I mean, we have a, 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 a astronomical problem called the great inequality of yes. Jupiter. Uh, yes. And that's been, I mean, they've been pondering this. <laughs> and Jupiter and Saturn. It. Jupiter and Saturn, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is between Jupiter and Saturn. Sorry, yeah. Mm -hmm. Could you and and this is of course also described in in detail in the book. But, okay, but briefly. Yeah, brief, briefly. They were discussing like crazy uh, in the uh, 18th century. Why um, does uh, why do Jupiter and Saturn realign? They are offset, you know. They they are offset uh, because they are returning every sixty years in the same line of sight, but not quite. So they were saying, "Oh, maybe Jupiter is accelerating, Saturn is slowing down, or vice versa," and that will mean that in, in, in the long run, uh, Jupiter will crash into the sun, the Saturn will go away, uh, far away in the distance, and they were discussing this like crazy. The only reason why they, they are upset as they are viewed is because we are moving. In 60 years, we are doing 60 times 14,000 kilometers. So that will make a little, you know, parallax effect on their conjunctions. And that's also explained in one single graphic. I mean, I think a 12-year-old can understand what I'm doing in that graphic and it solves the great inequality, which was the, one of the biggest debates they had in the 18th century. There are so many things. I mean, if if you if um, the listeners are not going to have the patience to read my whole 32 chapter book, they could at least try and go to chapter 31, uh, next before last, and read the 36 short things that the tigers resolves that's what i that's the chapter i went to without okay. even know without even being told to i'm like hey that looks like a great chapter i'm gonna go yeah there. yeah yeah it's very very compact you know it's very synthetic <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, and I mean it's it's the same thing with the moon because the the astronomers they speculate, oh, the moon is uh, is it speeding up? No, it's slowing down, right, Simon? They they uh, figure uh, so oh, the moon yes. might yes. eventually crash into Earth. But yeah. actually, no, 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 no. Okay. It's supposed to yeah, go sorry. away. Sorry, sorry. No, no, I have to interrupt. It's yes. supposed to go away from us slowly yeah. by yeah. three centimeters a year. Or four centimeters a year, and that's explained as well. 
why do you think that? It's not going away from us. Thank God the moon is staying with us. It's going to stay with us. But they are calculating that the moon is going slowly away from us. Patrick, remember, it's not yeah. the... Yeah. Not no, the, no, no, okay, it? yeah. I, 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 uh, I also have another question from Mike that kind of expands on the sort of the... Uh, Almost like the simulation type stuff, but given your theory and its apparent accuracy in accordance with the laws of parsimony, a so-called Occam's razor argument can be made in favor of the Tycho's model, obviously. But if because it's more logical, do you think artificial intelligence will eventually verify the Tycho's model of the solar system? <laughs> artificial intelligence? You believe in that stuff? <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, I mean, if we have intelligence, uh, humans, uh, then I think we can we can confirm this model uh, independently uh, using our own by someone exactly. given reason. <laughs> but exactly. I, I don't so know if we can design a machine who can answer that question for us. I'm, I've but been we can... working with uh, computers all my life, and I'm I'm a bit uh, skeptical to to the okay, claims yeah. of or. <laughs> artificial intelligence to put it mildly but at the yes, same time yes. the computer has done such a great job here of proving its um it's it's you know uh, i'm looking for the word i'm losing it escaping around but it's proven it's it's uh legitimacy i mean you can show here that it's here you can measure all the measurements are the same here is the model spinning on the computer I mean, 50 years ago, if you were trying to draw mm -hmm. this on paper, people would be like, come on, you guys are fucking crazy. Get the fuck out yeah, of here. Yeah, 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 but yeah, now yeah. you can be like, boom, play, check it all yeah, out. It exactly. all matches up. Tell yeah. me where I'm fucking wrong. And eventually, Precisely. a couple computer models, you know, 10, 20 years down the road, the, the computer's just going to find those holes and it's going to become, <laughs> you know, you, you, the, the same holes you're pointing out, I think... You know, the, maybe NASA is more apt to take it from their supercomputer when it tells them they're fucked. But I mean, <laughs> like we said earlier, I'm I'm not convinced that they don't know some of this stuff. But it's just easier not to tell us because it makes Earth seem special, which starts making people think about. I mean, whether you want to go there or not, intelligent design, or maybe there's more to life than just these fucking bureaucrats. You know. Yeah, I mean, and even as a research tool, like the Tychosium, like I just went out, for example, uh, to the whole solar system, like the whole thing, and ran it like on a year, and you can see it, you can see it pumping like a machine in a way, right? Like you talk about a drive shaft, but each orbit has got its own sort of um, rhythm, and and the whole thing's it's like a like clockwork. So I mean that you could use it in all kinds of research ways too. I mean, it's mm. look, guys, since you mentioned AI. Since you mentioned artificial intelligence, now I'm going to make a little boastful um, declaration. Guys, I've been sitting here 10 years. I mean, I, I started 10 years ago looking at this. And what have I done? I've been reading hundreds of books, mostly old books and also modern, and comparing this. Thing. Well, if you, do, you want, do you want to feed into robots? the capacity to go and read books in five languages like I do <laughs> and, and, and compare all these, you know, you know figures and, and go and find those books, you know, wherever they are. And thanks to internet. I mean, I'm very, I'm very grateful to internet. Otherwise I, I would have gone, have to go into libraries all over the world <laughs> to find this data, but I've done that. And I don't think a robot would, would have managed to do that the best AI machine couldn't have done that. We still are the best thinkers. We have a brain that is amazing if we only apply it properly and with uh, diligence, I think. What was the thing? Yeah, that, I kind of think it'll that... always be a tool as well. Was that? The, the computers and the AI, no matter how well it gets, it'll always just be a tool. Yeah. Well, what, Simon, what man. was it that, what was it that like triggered you to... Like, was there something that kind of made you go down this path or was there something that really stood out for you? Like, how did you sort of yeah. come to this? Yeah, the, 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 the first question I get usually. I started, um, I think it was because I was wondering why the sun uh, does this analemma every year. Do you know what the analemma is? Yeah, yeah. 
It's the like shape. That, it's like the shape it's of the eight, infinity eight in a way. Eight, yeah. yeah. It's a long, elongated eight shape that the sun does every year. So it goes up and down. Of course, right. it goes up and down because that's winter and summer. So yeah. I can yeah. I can understand that why it's low in December and high in June. But I couldn't figure out why it would be kind of wobbling left and right. So so it, it would draw an eight. Okay. And the eight is also asymmetric. It's not. It, it's not symmetric. It's it's shorter up and bigger down. This eight shape. Yep. Isn't that like so, an ancient symbol for chaos too? Sorry. I thought there was like in some a bunch of ancient symbology other than infinity around that that eight that eight yeah, especially with the bigger the size on the bottom. Yeah, it's a symbol of infinity as well. But, you know, the funny thing is that this um, analemma was printed on all the globes be before in the past, but they, now they don't have it on the new globes <laughs> that you can buy. They have, the, they have the, the, you know, they've kind of obfuscated the analemma because they can't explain it. The, the analemma is explained in my book in um, some chapter, and um, it has still, again, once again, it has to do with our... Earth's motion, because we are going in this straight line I talked about before. So at sometimes we will have the sun on one side and the sun on the other side. And we also, we earthlings, we do a trochoid ourselves every year, which I also illustrate in the book. We do a trochoid, like um, if you think about um, an astronomer looking at the sun for a whole year, he himself will be doing a trochoid. I don't know if you follow me, but that's also something which needs to be shown graphically. So and you we, were you were seeing the analemma then as as long stretched out long um, longer than than height, and that made yes. you sort of go down this whole rabbit hole, or that's yeah, what started well, the whole I, thing. I, I was completely I was I was completely blocked for for many many months and maybe years. I, I couldn't figure out what you know until I then started doing other things. I actually the analemma is funny because it I was I, I was triggered by the analemma, but I I failed for many years to understand it, and only at the end of my research I can now explain it. That, that's pretty fascinating to me, at least. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yes. now I can explain it. I can explain it even, um, you know, in mathematics. I mean, I can show, I can demonstrate why it has that shape. And that's all I can say now. I, I, I can't explain everything here on a radio show. So, well, it's it's amazing. I mean, I'm 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 pretty floored. This is like my first time ever hearing about this. Is just today, and uh, uh, you guys have done a pretty great job. The model on the internet is great, and yeah. I'm eager to go into this because there's more than meets the eye, and with that's going on with this model, whatever's going on, whatever the fuck's going on, there's more than meets the eye to anyone who's paying attention and looking at the numbers and. You know, this I think maybe gets us a little bit, a little bit closer. Mm, yeah. Mm. Where yeah, can people well, find you. all this stuff? Where can people follow you guys? Follow your work, uh, all that stuff. Find the book. Where can they get the book? Patrick, chicos dot space. That's that's the place uh, where you can go and you can, uh, and then you can you come to a landing page and you can uh, click to a link to read the book and you can have a link to to uh, use Tycosium. And we are also currently working to put up a forum where uh, uh, the Tycos model can, can be discussed. Uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, we, we, are, we have been doing this for several years now. Simon's uh, a few, quite a few more years than me, and I've been helping him with the... Uh, with, um, uh, programming and simulation and and the reason i got into this was because uh, i i actually you know I, I i couldn't think this was the case so i i wanted to help him out mm. to see where <laughs> where we would hit uh, yeah. when, when because i mean in, in science when you as uh, the, as it goes uh, a demonstration is the is the strongest form of uh, of evidence for a model 
if you can demonstrate it, well, then, then you really have something. And, and also, if you can't demonstrate it, then you have a problem. And the thing is here that this is actually the first uh, model of our solar system that actually works geometrically. And what do I mean with that? Well, we have all these nice uh, stellarium and, and things, but, but the problem with them is that you, you can always you can only see the, the uh, planetary motions from an Earth-based view. You can't seamlessly move into a helicopter space view or down to Earth-centric view. And as a teacher, I'm, I'm, I'm working hard now on, on building a new version of Tychosium. And that will be the first uh, planetarium or stellarium where you can seamlessly move. You can, you can fly down and see things from Earth, and then you can move up and see things from above in the same uh, Euclidean space or, or geometrical model. And this you cannot do in any uh, simulator or, or planetarium today. So That's that will great. be a, yeah. a world first. That's yeah. great. I have a question about your about your thing from from our buddy Mike. Um, do you have to put any constraints or embellishments on the Tychosium to make things come out properly? Is the data used in the Tychosium directly from Tycho Brahe's data and does it match modern observation? All right, I take that question. <laughs> yes. Uh, the data used for the Tychosium is uh, taken straight from all the accepted data, all the tables that we have. And uh, simply what I've done is that, of course, there is one difference. It's that they say that the planets accelerate and decelerate. So they have two different, you know, a maximum speed and a minimum speed. I've just taken the average speed. You see? Yeah, and yeah. that was my bet when I started with when I started calculating the the, the figures for the Tychosium, which Patrick actually then implemented in this in this JavaScript machine, which uh, which I was absolutely incapable of doing. So I was I was so so lucky to meet Patrick, who is an, an extremely brilliant computer programmer, and and he. He, he also is very humble because he says, well, I didn't have so much experience in this kind of, of uh, you know, graphic um, machines. But he has done an incredible job of just transposing all these small calculations and made on paper. And we were actually quite flabbergasted in the beginning because it very quickly started working. Sort of. But, you know, then you, we have been fine-tuning the Tychosium. Uh, and it's going to be even better now with the new version. And he's doing a monstrous job. But Patrick is doing a monstrous job to make this is going to be the the the, the ruling planetarium for the ages. I dare say, the only one that really uh, respects every every observational data collected by all astronomers over the centuries. I'm not exaggerating. We we have everything matches, even back in BC, you know. Where was the moon? When was the real solar eclipse in 135 BC? Well, bang, there it is, and so forth. And uh, yes, it's taking time because we're only two guys. We are two people. Usually these planetariums have like a, a team of 30. The Stellarium uh, simulator, which Patrick mentioned, has like, I don't know how many, 40, 5, 50 people <laughs> working on it. And we are just two guys. Yeah, and it's great. So, it great we, already, we, so. we are sorry for the delay, you know. We, we haven't still got to the perfection, but we are pretty close to it. The Tychosium is now remarkably precise. And even with, um, for instance, we have uh, inserted the Halley's Comet. Halley's Comet is, is, is in there as yeah. well. How, does that play a role in the structure of our solar system? An extremely important role uh, Halley's Comet plays because that has so many important um, historical um, uh, you know, uh, sightings. That they, we can find it in many books. So I have been able to use Halley's to... To, to, to prove 
the 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 the, the correctness of the whole uh, simulator, and it does so to an incredible uh, degree of precision. And although Halley's moves in a completely different way than what they say, they say that comets move in cigar-shaped orbits. Graham, okay. yeah. Long, elongated, cigar-shaped orbits <laughs> comets are supposed to do. But no, in, in our system, the comets move in circular uh, orbits, although they do loops. They have trochoidal, a trochoidal motion. They do loops, but they, are, they, they go in perfectly round, circular um, orbits, and they return to Earth. The thing is, with, with Halley's, it, it, it will be... Uh, visible for two years, successive years, and that has confused all the astronomers for uh, for uh, all times, because sometimes they saw a comet before one one year before, one year after, but now we, we can't go into Halley's. It's such a it's a complicated matter. But Halley's is is chapter thirty in my book. But anyone who is versed in astronomy could even start with chapter 30 because I think it's the most compelling proof of the correctness of the Tychosium simulator. Well, that answers another question from our buddy Matt, too. So that's another question from Mike and Matt. So thank okay. you very much. Yeah, Right on. Thank you, gentlemen, for staying up uh, late for us, for dealing with the, uh, the cross seas. I mean, that's another beautiful boot. These computers, we can do this from across the world. And see pictures while we're doing it. But, uh, man, yeah. this has been something else. Thanks, gentlemen. Yeah, well, we'll do another one. We'll do maybe we can focus on a, a visual representation with on video with uh, with the with the with psycho with Tychosium and all that. Yeah, so that YouTube special. Yeah, we should do that. Yeah, one one directly made for video. That would be nice. Yeah, that would be great. And and thank you so much, guys, for for having us. And uh, yes. I really like your shows and 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 uh, follow them, uh, and uh, yeah, it's so interesting all, yes. all this stuff that's coming up. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, thanks, guys. And we'll point everybody to your websites and then the book on there. And uh, yeah, take us dot space. Okay, yeah, that's all you need to remember. Have yes. a great day, gentlemen. Short and simple. <laughs> thanks, guys. Yeah. That was bye awesome. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Th thanks. Take care. Okay, bye. Take care. Bye bye. And that was our chat with, uh, what are the names? The Tycho Simon, Space Guys, Simon, Simon and, and Patrick. Simon and Patrick. Uh, that was great. Nice yeah, one. I knew, you'd, I knew you'd be blown away coming in cold on that. Yeah. Cold guy on the street. I'm the guy on the yeah. street. Big thanks to Simon and Patrick for coming on the show, both of them all the way from the other side of the world. So fantastic for them to make that work for us. Big thanks to you guys for listening. Even bigger thanks to you guys, our, our supporters, grandamerica.ca slash support. Couldn't do this without you. It's only about 1% of you guys that choose to support, you know, going on 600 free episodes we've done here. We're going to get this one recorded on video for you so you guys can go to the YouTube channel and see all the stuff we're talking about visually. And all that costs time and money. Grammarica.ca slash support. If you're getting some value from our little podcast here, sign up there, get some value back our way. The monthly or one-time donation, head over to GrammericaOutlaw.ca to check out our other podcast. America.ca slash chats if you want to get into our free chat room that uh, you don't have to worry about getting kicked out of. No censorship and no spying. Well, Graham might be spying, but I don't think so. And uh, contact at thecabin.com for events. Anything else? No, that's about it. Adultbrain.ca for the books. Yeah. All right. We love you guys. Thanks for listening. And we will see you next week.
Die.